And I wanted to start off today by just kind of noting that obviously it's Columbus Day today. And that feels like a particularly appropriate way to sort of feel into um, a really core theme of what this book is about. What I'd like to do is to begin with a riddle, if you will, which relates to uh, this, this kind of theme of Columbus Day today. And I'll call it the riddle of Admiral Joan and Columbus. So we all know about Columbus, obviously. Uh, pretty much every one of us can, uh, can know that he set sail from Spain in 1492, um, and he discovered the, the New World. Um, and when he did that, he had about 90 men in three threadbare boats that were, really were barely seaworthy. In fact, um, a rudder on one of them broke after three days at sea, and they had to, to stop at the Canary Islands for repairs. So that was 1492. Now, almost 100 years before that, in 1405, <clears throat> in um, setting out from China, um, there was somebody called Admiral Zheng He, and he set sail from China with the greatest armada in history. He had 27,000 men in his armada, in over 300 ships. And these were real ships. You could actually fit um, 10 of Columbus's boats in one of his, of his major ships. Like, there was that difference in technology. And he went on seven long voyages for uh, over 28 years in total. And he's, he basically owned the Indian Ocean. He went to places like Sumatra, uh, Sri Lanka, all the way to Arabia, and all the way down to East Africa. It wasn't a, a spot, really, where he couldn't go to. Uh, and he had this amazing power and control. So the riddle is, why do we know about Columbus? And why, barely, unless you're a, a, a Chinese historian, uh, do we not even know about this Admiral Zheng He? Why isn't it called Zheng Day rather than Columbus Day? Well. Some historians, uh, and, and more recent modern historians, have uh, basically looked at that question and answered it with uh, an approach to history that's often known as a geographical determinism. And they say, well, it's simple. Um, it's not that Europe was so special or anything like that. Um, it's simply that Europe uh, was closer. And so Europe got there first. And if the Chinese had gotten there first, then yeah, the whole of history would be totally different. But my approach that I've taken in this book, and then I'll take us through today, is that actually that's not the case. That even if Admiral John had actually uh, discovered America before the Europeans, like if the trade winds and currents had allowed them to sort of sail in the Pacific easily to just hit the, um, the, the New World, quote unquote, that way, that it actually he would never have done um, the, same, the things that Columbus did. And uh, it would not, we still wouldn't be calling it Joan Day rather than Columbus Day. And that's because it, the, the kind of deeper truth that I look at in, in this book, in the whole book, is this notion of how culture shapes values and how those values shape history. And the important implication of that is that the values that we hold as a society today um, may shape our future. And that's why this issue is not just an, a kind of theoretical academic issue, but it's an issue about what kind of future we, as a society, want to create for our, our descendants. So let's start off by going back to Columbus and taking a look at what happened when he landed. So he landed. Um, we think, in the island that's now known as um, Hispaniola. And he was amazed by what he saw as kind of the innocence of these um, native people he came across. And we know exactly where his mind was at, because he wrote in his journal uh, quite in quite some detail. So one important passage we see from his journal when he first got there is he writes, and I'll quote, he writes, they are so artless and free with all they possess, that no one would believe it without having seen it. Of anything they have, if you ask them for it, 
They never say no. Rather, they invite the person to share it and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts. So sweet, right? But Columbus doesn't stay in that, in that place for very long. His mind starts wandering to other thoughts. And then, um, very shortly, shortly later, he's writing a letter to Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. And he writes, They do not bear arms, and they don't know them. For when I showed them a sword, they took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. And then he goes, Exploitation. He goes, They would make fine servants. Should your majesty's command it, all the inhabitants could be taken away to Spain or made slaves on the island. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. So this is the mindset we see. And, you know, people say, well, Columbus was just like other people with his time. You know, don't get so, uh, so down on him. And there's actually a lot of truth in that. The, the, the people, um, the whole mindset of the wave after wave of European, first the conquistadors and then other um, settlers who came to North and South America had a similar approach of really what we might call ruthless exploitation. Just the explorers, we, all they, they were concerned about how can we enrich ourselves? How can we um, pay back and enrich the people who just financed us? And as, as we know, the, the, the result was really the greatest genocidal catastrophe that has occurred yet in human history. Okay. Basically, everywhere European explorers went, there was, the, there was followed by this decimation of the local population in unimaginable proportions. You know, and it helps you just look at some numbers to get a feeling for what we're talking about. When uh, Columbus first arrived, yeah, there at uh, 1492, the population of central Mexico is estimated at being roughly 20 million people. And that was four times greater population than Britain had at that time. Within a century, there were fewer than a million people alive there. Yeah. Similarly, same thing in the Inca Empire in South America. They, they were estimated to have about 11 million people there before the Europeans arrived, and less than a million a hundred years later. And it's been estimated that in that century alone, the 16th century, close to a hundred million indigenous people died in the Americas through a combination of slaughter, starvation, and disease. Just, just such enormous proportions. Now, many historians have looked at that and said, yes, but you know, we've got to look at the diseases the Europeans brought. That was the thing that really um, made the difference. That's what ravaged the populations. And some historians will even go so far as to say, you know, it's, it was an inner, inadvertent catastrophe. It's, a, it's like a sad but inevitable consequence of human progress. This is just what happened because the indigenous people were not, you know, they, they, weren't, they, they didn't have immunity to the Eurasian germs and everything else. And while there is no doubt that those diseases played a huge impact uh, in, in causing havoc in, among the people of North and South America, and some, some historians who've looked at this in detail, a couple that I'd, I'd name it, David Stannard and Eduardo Galeano, two great historians, have really excruciatingly documented how, at the same time, the Europeans did approach this, this sort of new world with a systematic compulsion to exploit everything they could remorselessly, both human and mineral. Their approach was to just ransack the land, make up the rules of the game as they went along to exploit whatever they could. And what I discovered as I did the research for this book, for The Patterning Instinct, was that this obsession with sort of exploitation, we've come to accept as, well, that's kind of the way the world works. That's normal human behavior, let's face it. And actually, it was unique to the European mindset among all other cultures that existed. Um, in earlier times. But because that's now become the predominant global mindset, we just take that as a given. We don't even really question that that's, that's kind of what happens. That's the way the world works. So what's interesting about that is that, you know, when we don't look at these underlying values, we kind of think that the direction of history is somehow inevitable. But when we start to look at uh, how values affect history, we begin to see that actually what happened in history was a consequence 
of a particular way of thinking that arose only in Europe. So to get a sense of where I, what I mean more by that, let's turn back to old Admiral, Admiral Jerome Hur uh, in that early part of the 15th century. Well, he had all the power that he could possibly want. In fact, he left such a fine impression in some parts of, of, of where he landed, he was deified. And they actually, they actually made him into a god. And there's, even now, there's temples where you can actually see an image of Admiral Zheng as a, as a god that people worship. He had that much power. And um, his ships inspired awe wherever he visited, which is not surprising when you consider that his 27,000 people were more than the entire local population of many of the places where he landed. And he wasn't afraid to use his military might when needed. When there was piracy, he would suppress it. And sometimes uh, he was friendly with a local politician and he'd use um, his power to influence the local politics. So he could have, if he'd wanted, he could have enslaved the populations. He could have mined the mineral wealth. He could have entrenched you know, China's wealth, had this massive Chinese empire all through every, every part of the Indian Ocean. Instead, what did he do? He set up embassies in China's capital, Nanjing. Um, and he would bring emissaries from Japan, Malaya, Vietnam, Egypt, um, Africa to, to China and treat them with respect. And the idea was to sort of show the prestige of the, of the Middle Kingdom, of, of what China was, to let the rest of the world know what a humane and advanced place China was in the world. So we can see how the cultural values that uh, different cultures have can really shape history like that. It would have been as unthinkable for Joan to have conquered and enslaved those societies he visited with her, his armada as it would have been unthinkable for Columbus to have set up embassies with the indigenous people in the New World. I mean, imagine Columbus saying, oh yeah, look, at, we, we should bring some of these native people back as ambassadors to Spain. Just totally unthinkable. So what was this kind of value system? that Admiral Zheng came from. So in China, the predominant aim of political power was to sustain a society's equilibrium. Like the, the use of military force was seen as something um, you do when it's necessary to maintain stability. And they applied that same thinking to their approach to natural resources, much to the amusement of the early missionaries who went there from Europe. There's this fascinating uh, note that is written by some, uh, one of these missionaries called Jean-Baptiste Duald, um, who is mystified why they failed. The Chinese were failing to mine all the gold and silver in some mountains that were close by. So he wrote in his journal how, um, he says, the Chinese say the mountains are full of gold and silver, but that the working of them has been hindered from some political views that the public tranquility might be disturbed by the too great abundance of these metals, which would make the people haughty and negligent of agriculture. So it's so fascinating to see this kind of window on these traditional Chinese ideas with this almost like this puzzled understanding from Europe. So the traditional Chinese view of power was um, the, what they called the mandate of heaven. The emperor was assumed to have the power to rule um, because he was given the mandate by, by heaven but um, they would only endorse the emperor if he ruled responsibly. And what's fascinating is um, the Chinese word for the word govern and care for is the same word. It comes from the same root. Meanwhile, the European view of power was to basically disrupt any equilibrium uh, and, to sort of, and to look at that um, as a as a way that actually has a value in itself, that it's a good thing to do. And we can see that, actually, if we go, we can go all the way back, way earlier than, um, than Columbus, or the sort of more modern European history. We can see something that is unique to Europe, that again is different from any other culture in the world. So it's not just Europe versus China. It's Europe um, with this kind of different mindset than we see in other indigenous cultures. So, let's go all the way back to Alexander the Great. And we know, you know some of the great stories, how he, was, he had this amazing empire in just a few short years, went all the way to, as far as India, as far as the end, edges of the known world. 
and form this great empire. And there's this fascinating story that's said about Alexander that some of you may know. It. It's the story of the Gordian knot. So this story is about how there was an area um, in the Middle East called um, Phrygia. And these Phrygians uh, were without a rule at once. And their oracle prophesied the first person to enter the capital in an ox cart would be their next king. So it just so happened that a peasant called Gordius entered the capital in this ox cart. Um, he was made the next king. So he was so grateful, so he dedicated his cart in gratitude to the gods, and he tied its shafts to a post in this elaborate knot. And the oracle prophesied whoever undid that knot would become the king of all Asia. But no one had ever succeeded in undoing it because it was tied together in this special way where there were no ends to work. So he just couldn't get at it. So Alexander came there, and he heard this, his legend said, okay, I'm going to get that knot. So he came up with a devastating simple solution. He drew his sword and sliced the knot cleanly in half. And as the oracle predicted, he went on to become the ruler of Asia. So in this case, what's so interesting is nobody went around saying, he was a cheat. He like broke the rules. That wasn't, that, that wasn't like the way you meant to do it. He, but he just... He was lauded for the fact that he disrupted the rules of the game. He said, I've got the power, I'm going to come up with a new set of rules, and by doing that, I'm going to take power. So again, we get this notion of disruption as being a value in itself. What I find interesting is that around the same time as Columbus, there was another uh, great emperor. Uh, this one was an emperor in ancient India. His name was Ashoka. And um, he actually, he inherited from his grandfather, Chandragupta, this um, empire covering most of the subcontinent of India. It was huge. And he went on to show his own military prowess. He conquered a region called Kalinga. And we know about all this because he erected a stupa, a monument, commemorating his achievement. But what's so fascinating is this is not like some commemoration that we might be expecting to see from ancient times, like how great, what a great emperor I am, etc., etc. And Ashoka had recently converted to the new religion of Buddhism. And in this stupa, the inscription he wrote lamented the destruction he had caused. He actually wrote on the stupa, on conquering Galinga, his majesty felt remorse. For when an independent country is conquered, the slaughter, death, and deportation of the people is extremely grievous. Today, if a hundredth or a thousandth part of those people were to suffer similarly, it would weigh heavily on the mind of his majesty. And he actually goes on to say, because um, he was believing in this Buddhist notion of Dharma as a way of life, of connecting with the universe. Um, and he even went on to say, this inscription of Dharma has been engraved so that any sons or great-grandsons that I may have should not think of gaining new conquests. They should only consider conquest by Dharma to be a true conquest, and delight in Dharma should be their whole delight. Now you might say, okay, cherry-picking, you know, we've got one uh, great emperor here, one there, but does this really show uh, a cultural mindset of, the, of this contrast I'm talking about? Well, there's a couple of interesting things to look at that suggest that it's not just cherry-picking, but these are actual meaningful examples of different ways of looking at the world. So, uh, even if we look at Ashoka, and generations before him, in the reign of his grandfather, there was a classic of statecraft called the Arthur Sastra that was written, sort of a little bit like Machiavelli's as the prince. It became this notion of this is how you're meant to, a uh, rule is meant to be. But this is the kind of thing it said about conquering territory in this, in this uh, classic. It said, having acquired new territory, the conqueror shall substitute his virtues for the enemy's vices, and where the enemy was good, he shall be twice as good. He shall follow policies that are pleasing and beneficial by acting according to his dharma and by granting favors and exemptions, giving gifts and bestowing honors. And if anyone still questions, well, how do we, you know, really know that people actually lived according to these principles? What's so interesting is India actually had their own colonies. And in fact, uh, they, we, we call them the East Indies uh, because historically they had so much power and influence over that part of the world that again, they, they could have done whatever they wanted to 
Uh, they could have enslaved those populations and like mined their materials, etc. Instead, they actually uh, developed a peaceful trading network that enhanced the whole cultural sophistication of that whole area. Um, and a lot of their ideas became part of, South, of Southeast Asia that, again, only got disrupted when, in fact, the Portuguese came in the, uh, in the 15th, 16th century and, again, changed the rules of the game and disrupted hundreds uh, of years of stability there. So we see this propensity of European minds to like, disrupt, to change the rules of the game, to gain a power advantage over others. And then we can see through history how it develops. We see the slave trade, where again, uh, going past the Spanish and Portuguese, the uh, northern Europeans went, what a great opportunity here. Let's you know, ship these slaves from Africa, um, yeah, they, and we, we can use them to get our, our new crops uh, together. Six million uh, people were shipped as slaves in the 18th century alone. A total of 12 million people, it's estimated suffered, so many of them dying on the actual ships, of course, coming to the, uh, to the Americas. And even when abolition occurred in the early 19th century, um, the, those in power just developed new forms of exploitation using indentured labor and forced trading practices to maintain this domination over the rest of the world. So as late as around 1900 or so, um, you have Cecil Rhodes, famous uh, colonial um, uh, sort of magnate, if you will, who wrote in, in his journal um, breathlessly, we must find new lands from which we can easily obtain raw materials and at the same time exploit the cheap slave labor available from the natives of the colonies. He goes, the colonies would also provide a dumping ground for the surplus goods produced in our factories. He's got the whole thing worked out. This is how we're going to exploit the rest of the world. And that European mindset, that way of thinking, was applied equally to the natural world. So Francis Bacon, the prophet of the scientific age, um, famously said, um, knowledge itself is power. And he gave this clarion call um, to really conquer nature. He said, you know, we should establish and extend the power of dominion of the human race itself over the universe, render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. So then, when we look at these lessons of history, and then we look at the modern world, we can see that that same way of thinking that led, say, the Spaniards, when they got to a place like Potosi in Bolivia, the biggest silver mine in the world, where they basically they mined every last grain of it. They enslaved um, millions of people. In fact, probably more people died prematurely in that mountain on Bolivia than any one place in the world. It's estimated as many as 8 million people died uh, mining the, that silver. So that now you can't even find a grain of it. It's, they got every last piece of dust of silver out of that mountain. So that's the kind of way of thinking that leads today's fossil fuel companies to rape the earth through fracking, through tar sands extraction, even what we know that carbon emissions are threatening the future of our civilization. And then looking, how can we get that last that last extraction still makes some more money. And we see the same thing with our notions of morality. So we see this moral ease with which Europeans were just fine with enslaving millions of people and working them to their death for their wealth. We see that same kind of grotesque mentality in today's world where it's hard to even comprehend, but the wealthiest six men in the world right now own as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population, over three and a half billion people. So th this is why it feels that the way we choose to celebrate Columbus Day can tell us so much about our civilization's future. That as long as we celebrate these values that allow us to exploit others recklessly and to view the Earth as a resource to plunder, we could be headed for environmental catastrophe. But there, and there's a lot we can learn from this uh, viewpoint of traditional China, this recognition of the importance of using power for stability, to maintain rather than to disrupt. But we don't even have to go to Admiral Zhang to look at that. Um, we see that here in the values uh, 
and um, ways of living of the indigenous people who still continue their traditions here in North America and in South America. We see that in, St in Standing Rock, where um, when people were fighting against these kind of extractive, uh, extractive behaviors that were going to poison their land, they did so with this, these prayers of love and respect for the natural world and the importance of responsible stewardship for future generations. And we see that now in South America, where indigenous people are uh, organizing against some of the destruction of the rainforest there. And there there's actually um, new ideas forming in, some of, in the constitution itself of places like Bolivia and Peru called Buen Vivir, which is an actual worldview coming from indigenous um, ways of thinking, of connectivity, that uh, offer a different way of taking meaning from the world, leading to a different set of values than we take for granted here in, in mainstream thinking in the West. So, you know, we see now that um, many mun municipalities around the states have recognized this. And um, in Berkeley, where I come from, uh, it's actually uh, called Indigenous Peoples Day, as it is in many uh, um, other cities um, and areas around the country, and that's increasing. Um, so it kind of makes, makes us wonder, I wonder if it would be a moment when our civilization is actually shifting its trajectory, if and when, um, at the federal level, it's actually, would it actually a change to, rather than calling it Columbus Day and honoring these kinds of values we're talking about, if it's actually called federally Indigenous Peoples Day, and there's this kind of shift to show that there are different values that could lead us to a different place in our civilization. So, I wanted to take you through this, this kind of talk today, and just using this kind of lens of Columbus Day as a way to kind of delve into what some of the themes of the Passing Instinct are about. Um, and it does go um, all the way from early hunter-gatherer times to the modern, modern days. Um, and so there's a lot of different areas that, um, that it looks at. But I think one of the most important themes, actually, is the way in which traditional China uh, did develop a way, a very, very sophisticated and, and systematic a way of relating to the universe that is so different from the, what we're used to in the West and the one that we can learn in the West. And at the same time, I, I did want to make sure that nobody would sort of walk away from this talk with believing that I'm somehow kind of glorifying some earlier time, like either glorifying um, earlier hunter-gatherer uh, cultures or some sort of golden age or, um, tr or traditional China. Every one of these societies um, was living their lives causing imbalances with the natural world. Even early hunter-gatherers uh, actually, as they moved tens of thousands of years ago into new continents, they thought nature was just this wonderful giving environment, and they led to mass extinctions of um, megafauna, big species, in North, South America, all over, all over the world. And traditional China, uh, with these values of stability, caused massive environmental destruction within their country. So what I think is the real lesson we can learn is that here we are in our modern world right now, where we can be more aware of what we're doing. The reason the hunter-gatherers did what they did, the reason the traditional Chinese uh, caused such destruction of their own society was because they didn't realize the implications of what they were doing one generation to the next until it happened and then they had to work with it. We have that possibility. And that's why I think it's so important that the more we can understand the ways in which we as a society uh, gain meaning from our, our world and that, how that leads to the values that we live according to, the more we have a chance to be conscious of where we actually can take society to. So thank you for that. And then I'd, I'd be very happy to uh, just um, answer any questions people have and, and discuss more of the themes about the book. <laughs>